I'm Miriam from Fun FTC, and I'm here with Team 21455, Ro Sofia, coming all the way from Romania. They, they're here at the World Championship, and they've already made it all the way to semifinals. And this, you know, this is a really unique robot, and I can't wait to learn more about it here on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you, and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotics scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. So can we start with like your approach to the game? So you all have a very unique drive train and drive base. So like what made you decide to do that? All right. So firstly, as you can see, the robot is pretty compact. Uh, you can turn it uh, normal for a second. I want to highlight something. The first thing we had in mind when we saw like the theme reveal was that we want a very small, very compact robot. It should go be able to go under the trusses, between the trusses, and under the stage doors. So where we have perfect uh, a perfect movement. So in order to do this, as you can probably have seen earlier, we have built a swerve drive train. Why did you choose swerve? We had a tried mechanum and we have tried tank. Mechanum is a very good drive train, but uh, Unfortunately, because it has that slip when you try to go very fast, very early, like when you accelerate very fast, it has the slip because of the gears on the wheels. It was just not going to cut it for us. We wanted to be able to move around, change directions really quick, be very swift on the field. So we decided that a swerve drive would be more appropriate for that. And the tank drive, I mean, it just doesn't have the strafing ability and cutting the mobility again. What, wasn't a sacrifice that we are willing to make. So we decided to go with a swerve drivetrain. It was, it actually started as a summer project, more or less for, from June, July. And after the reveal, we knew that it was gonna be viable and we started developing it even more. And uh, yeah, we got it as compact as possible, carrying everything because when you make a robot that drivetrain has like 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters, you need to have everything prepared, everything carried. Otherwise, just there are going to be just things that go into one another. So, if someone doesn't know, but I believe the majority will, a sort of drivetrain works more or less like a shopping cart trolley. You just you have four wheels that are individually uh, actionated by an axle servo motor, and uh, each wheel has its own direction and its own motor for rotation. Uh, the motor we use are go build a 6000 rpm without gear sets that, and the gear sets for reduction we build separately it's about 700 rpm and it's right here if you want to take a look at it yeah so it's a 700 rpm motor how heavy is your robot because that's really fast uh, well it's about 10 11 kilos we try to reduce the weight as much as possible. We pocketed like every single thing you can see inside. And we try to reduce as much weight on the outside as well with the, fiber, with the carbon fiber plates. And we are planning to reduce it even more. However, the carbon fiber sheets that need that uh, were shipped to us were shipped a little too late. So we wanted to replace this aluminum part and these with carbon fiber, but it was a little bit too late. With that, the robot could reach like nine kilos, maybe even eight. Wow. Another carbon fiber adjustment was also turning these axles into carbon fiber tubes, uh, which would also both like make the robot lighter and also just have less moving mass. So it would just be like nicer to work with. Nice. And so now that like you, this is like really light and small. So like what kind of sacrifices did you have to make on the rest of your robot in order to get that small and light? Well, I would say that the biggest sacrifice was the time because this robot took like a total of like five months to be developed. And so the biggest sacrifice I would say was the time we had for uh, programming and for driver's practice. 
that's like one of the biggest issues we have this season because the robot was is very well put together but it was done so a bit late and this is something that we really like to improve this season having a robot a little bit earlier but with the surf drive especially since this is our second year participating in the competition it was very very hard to find all the information put it together and actually build something on our own because there are not many teams who have surf drive uh, Mechanon Drive is very plug-in, it's not really plug-in-play, but more or less so. A surf drive, you have to build everything by yourself, including the code. So I'll pass the mic to our programmer to talk about the trajectories and how they made the code work. Okay, so the surf drive isn't really that hard to program. Like, there are enough uh, resources online. But the hard part with it is just making it play well with everything else. Like. The source drive, uh, first off, thanks to your FPS because you start having a lot more reads and a lot more writes. Because instead of having like four motors you need to control, you have four motors, four servos, and four encoders you permanently need to take care of. Uh, but uh, even with that, we managed to like get the frame time really good. You run at something about 250 FPS average. Uh, and we use that to pretty much just have the cleanest auto uh, on the field. Like we use a custom pure pursuit uh, that works with cubic Bezier trajectories. So you just define a start and end point, and then we can just uh, connect as many trajectories as we want. We can uh, like pull on them like cubic Beziers, and they just work really nice. Uh, other than that, truth be told, the programming went pretty good, so don't think that uh, uh, programming a surf should be uh, like determined. Like, if you want to do a surf, just trust me, you can. Great, and so now let's move on to what's on top of your swerve drive. So can you maybe start with your intake? So our intake is double pivoted. We choose to have this double pivot intake with these TPU bands right here. Uh, to make it more flexible, but also to have an angle for each of uh, the positions on uh, the stack of pixels. And that allows us to have a lot of wiggle room and to access nearly every single position that we would ever want. And even more than that, these TPU bands allow for protection on the motors on the intake itself, so that if a robot bumps into it, uh, it basically takes all the uh, pressure on it. And it does uh, nothing happens to it. Uh, the intake takes the pixels and put it, puts, puts them into this ramp. Uh, this ramp is equipped with uh, two, uh, two sensors that detect e each pixel. Uh, this really helps out in uh, two situations. One in the autonomous period where the robot uh, goes to the stack and will have to check if it, it grabbed two pixels. If not, it, it will enter a fail safe mode uh, where it will try uh, two or three times to go back to the stack and grab the pixels again. And it helps a second time in uh, the driver control period uh, where, as you can see uh, from a farther distance, uh, the drivers cannot really do not really have uh, any visibility on what pixels are in the uh, uh, RAM. So uh, these uh, sensors, whenever there are two uh, pixels equipped in the RAM, they send a haptic uh, response to back to the driver's controllers. So they can know uh, each time when to leave the stack or the wing and to just go to the back, or to the backdrops. And then those pixels from the RAM are transferred into this outtake. This outtake is a little bit creative because we use the differential system. Uh, we had to use the differential system on our outtake because uh, while using Swerve Drive, we already had uh, four server motor spaces occupied and then we had a little less wiggle room for uh, other uh, systems. So we, uh, in this differential, we use two server motors to make more actions. Uh, when the two server motors act in the same direction, this arm moves uh, in this uh, back or forth. And when uh, the two server motors act in different directions, this wrist here moves. And then we have another server motor up here that controls the rotation of the arm, uh, arm itself. And then uh, another two server motors to grab the two pixels. Uh, each, pixels uh, each pixel can be grabbed and dropped uh, independently. And it allows us for 
uh, easier mosaics or set lines, depending on the position of their and the wrist. Plus, another good another advantage of having the diffy, uh, you no longer need a servo up here, which would add more moving mass and just make it harder to control, since everything, every like moving part is down here, uh, stationary, it just solves a lot of like moving mass issues. All right, great. So now let's just like go back to your intake. Can you tell me like what is on your rollers and like why did you choose that material? Okay, so we went through quite a couple of iterations uh, with the intakes. First we had just zip ties, but they just made a lot of noise, didn't catch well and like wore out pre everything. Uh, so then we went like tubes that are used for motorcycles, uh, which had like better flexibility, but they were just a bit too flexible and too easy to destroy. Like we would have to change them up every like six, seven games. Uh, but in the end, we managed to reach these ones, which are pretty much just uh, tubes used for chemistry. They are everything resistant. They are very flexible and very abrasive, as well as being hard to like destroy. I cannot just pull in it and just uh, tear it apart. It's, it will just stand still, steadfast. Uh, and we have had no problems ever since moving to these ones. Uh, right. And then have you had any problems with getting the pixels like once they're intake? Like, have you got, had any problems with jams like in the transfer or anything? So. We used to have problems like in the uh, taking from the stack because pixels would just get stuck here. That's why we added like the, these printed inserts uh, to pretty much just prevent any pixel from going up and then getting stuck. But afterwards, uh, coming into the ramp, uh, we had problems with like the pixels uh, climbing up on top of each other. And so we took a page from Silas's book and added like hinges here, such that pixels would not be able to like come here and then like climb up. They would just have to come one over the other. If they would try to climb up, they would get, get blocked by these hinges. But like they need to be uh, like movable, such that when the outtake comes, these hinges like raise up and let the pixels out. So yeah, that's pretty much all the problems we've had with uh, and how we solved them yeah. with the intake. We also actually added these other printed inserts, which would just keep the pixels flat on the ground and just lower the chances they get up on top of each other even more. Perfect. And then can you talk more about how your grabber works? Well, it's pretty simple. You just have these, like, uh, walls which have the pixels come in here and then here when these like claws come the pixels get stuck in here and then here uh, like three uh, points where we can like hold them from which just makes them stand still and then we can just release each one individually like it's not rocket science it just works all right, well, if it works, it works. So now, yep. can we move on to what happens during the end game period and starting off with your drone? Well, our drone went through many iterations. Uh, we started off as probably the majority of teams did at kickoff with a very big airplane, like the one you used to do when we were children and play with it. However, we quickly realized that that wasn't necessarily the best idea for efficiency. So in the end, we decided to go with a much smaller drone. It is made from half of a half piece of paper and uh, for us it worked really well also another thing we did with this drone is that w going through many different iterations like folding it this way or that way we've seen that there are many many different outcomes so in order to assess it better and just not do it by trial and error we actually carried our drone for, into a software called Autodesk CFD only, and we put it through that software through an air tunnel. So like we could understand it much better. We also have it here on the pit. Here is the representation of 
the, our actual airplane through the air tunnel. And uh, down there you can also see a little bit of the vertex effect that happens when the plane goes right uh, down to fall uh, for the first or second zone. We had a pretty reliable first and second zones throughout this tournament. So I think that the drone is pretty good. The drone launcher has not seen very, mu many, very much modifications. It's all, the main thing we did with it is that we reduced its uh, overall footprint. We made it smaller because in the, at the beginning it was like this. It was bulky, it was heavy, and this smaller one just does the job. It, is, it works like uh, by tensioning this string before each game. And yeah, we have a micro servo motor that just releases it at the press of the button. And as I said, pretty reliable drone overall. All right, perfect. And then can you talk about your hang? Our hanging system uh, is a very, very different concept from what we began with. Firstly, we tried to go for a passive hanging system. So like we had two slides over it here and when the end game came, they would rise up and then we would try to run into the truss and then remain hanged there. But the problem was, this was pretty unreliable. The odometry always tends to push a little bit into the ground and then many of the hangs would not have been counted. So we decided to go for a normal separate hang. And because we didn't have enough space or enough motors, we decided to combine it with the outtake system. This means that we could no longer use the 1600 RPM motors we had for our, for our outtake. We had to use something with a little more torque. So 432 RPM for the entire outtake. More for the entire lift system and the hang was the best option for us. Uh, we also used two Misumi slides and one rails system because this enables us to go as high as possible on the backdrop without having a big footprint. Like if you added two more Misumi slides for the same uh, height limit, we would have been very bulkier and we have wouldn't have been able to reach it. Also, these uh, uh, hooks that we see here were also are made from aluminum and they were firstly cadded as well. And we went through many four simulations with them because we wanted to make sure that we could hang from every time, every position, and they wouldn't break. Each of these hooks can support up to 15 kilograms. So we can hang with only one hook. And we did that throughout the tournament in a uh, emergency situations when you don't have time to align, one hook is enough to sustain the weight of the entire robot and, if, and even more. So that's what we did for the hanging system. All right, great. And so now as we start to wrap up, uh, are you planning to compete in any off-season competitions? And if so, what changes do you plan to make to your robot? Um, I think it's a little bit early to say that. I. For me personally, I would love to go to as many off-season competitions as possible. And as for the changes, firstly, again, I would like to uh, change these plates for the carbon fibers on that are already at home, so it shouldn't be that much of a hassle. And then maybe work a little bit on the intake to try to make it more reliable. I think the ramp has, the angle of the ramp has to be a little more adjusted. But other than that, I can't think of anything else that would need changes for this uh, for our robot. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ro Sophia. This has been, you know, really in an incredible robot. Uh, congratulations on making it so far in the world championship. You know, making a limbs is just really impressive. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much as well for having us here, and we'll see you guys very soon with our next robot. <laughs> This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.